Well, I always love hearing Maria present and I always learn something from her. I'm gonna speak now about the mechanism of action, pharmacotherapeutic profiles and positionings of our JAK therapies or what are called JAKinibs. I do have disclosures that are relevant, although this is a CME presentation, these are my slides and I of course take responsibility for everything that I say. So first, I just want to remind you that there are different uh, JACs and STATs that are associated with them. The Janus kinase uh, enzymes are associated with signal transducer and activators of transcription, which lead to a variety of cytokines. And there are four JAK family members, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and the fourth one, just to confuse everyone, is called TIC2. And the examples of some of the cytokines that signal through the JAK stat pathways are listed here. Remember that Janus was the Roman god of two faces, and the Janus kinase enzymes have those two structural components to them. Uh, and also appreciate that there are different cytokine profiles based on the different JAKs. In fact, TIC2, you'll notice, um, is specific for IL-12 and 23. Uh, and maybe IL-22. And it's very interesting to think about that. And we've been thinking about that as being uh, potentially, ultimately an oral IL-23 type of therapy. Nonetheless, I wanted to point all this out to you so you know what we were talking about when I go through some of these JAK therapies. There are a number of JAK inhibitors that are in development uh, and they're listed here for you. I wanna point out to you that the only one that's of course available currently is what we call the non-selective JAK uh, tofacitinib, which is approved in the U.S. for ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriatic arthritis, as well as available in other parts of the world. Then we have a number of JAK1 selective inhibitors, which are listed here, which are uh, either being studied in Crohn's and UC, uh, or in the case of upadacitinib, you see that it's already available for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and then there's the TIC2 inhibitor, which is uh, being studied in plaque psoriasis and IBD, uh, as well as baricitinib, which you may have uh, known was in the news more recently because it was studied as a potential inhibitor of viral entry for COVID, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So uh, the variety of different JAKs to consider, and that's why this is an important topic for us to, to think about today. I'll briefly review the tofacitinib ulcerative colitis clinical program. This was the design of their phase three studies, which were two identical induction trials that looked at the eight week um, response, as well as then randomized those responders into the sustained maintenance trial. And what was interesting about the study design is that the patients received 10 milligrams twice daily for induction, and then in maintenance, we're either randomized to five milligrams, 10 milligrams, or placebo. And so you had built in here dose reduction. And this was uh, obviously of great interest, both for the concept of dose de-intensification, as well as subsequently, if they lost response when they were dropped to placebo or to five milligrams, they could go back up to 10 uh, in the open label extension. And we could look at what happens to people who relapse on five and go back to 10. So very interesting results. You probably know some of this already, which is um, the results that showed that clearly the therapy was better than placebo and induction, and that both doses were better than placebo in maintenance, both for clinical remission and then subsequently looking at what was termed mucosal healing. This is why it was approved for both doses in the maintenance phase. Uh, and also of interest was that the people who seemed to do better on 10 BID in maintenance were those who had already been on anti-TNF and had come to tofacitinib after losing response or failing to respond to the anti-TNF therapies. Now specifically of interest as well was the defined term delayed responders, which were the patients who didn't respond to those induction trials and then got an additional eight weeks of the 10 BID therapy. And you'll notice that this picked up a significant number of patients. So in the label for TOFA was the idea that if after eight weeks of 10 BID, if the patient hasn't gotten worse, but hasn't reached remission, you might treat for an additional eight weeks with 10 BID. So this concept of giving them the additional eight weeks to determine who are the delayed responders or the delayed remitters is a very important concept. Reminder, it doesn't mean the patient's getting worse 
or is unacceptably ill during these entire 16 weeks, because four months is a long time not to be getting better. And specific to this idea of looking at what happened to people who were in remission on 10 BID and then randomized to the five BID maintenance dose, you can see that although relapse in some of these patients did occur, you can also appreciate uh, as you look to the right here, that when you went back up to 10 BID, you were able to recapture most of these patients, not everybody, but most. So the issue of de-escalation uh, and making sure patients are truly in remission or that they've achieved objective remission with mucosal healing or at least improvement of labs and no rectal bleeding is key before considering dose reduction. And if they have relapse, and I would encourage you to have a monitoring strategy, you can recapture most by going up. The JAK and HIBs work fast. They have a predictable PK profile because they're small molecules that get absorbed through the wall of the small intestine. And therefore, they also shut down those cytokine profiles quickly. So these are thought to be anti-cytokine therapies. You can see in this particular analysis that those patients who respond to tofacitinib have reduction in their symptoms within three days, very quick onset of action. That should also remind you of how potent the therapy is. And similar to other therapies across the spectrum in IBD, patients who um, are TNF naive are more likely to achieve remission than those who are already TNF failures. So it's a tougher population to treat the TNF failures. It does work there and it was superior to placebo, but you get more bang for your buck when this was used before anti-TNF. Many of you know though that this was positioned and relabeled to be after anti-TNF because of the safety study that I'll summarize briefly in a moment. Now, because these are small molecules, the jaconims are of interest because we don't have to worry about the effect of protein leakage from an inflamed bowel, and therefore the exposure relationship that might lead to diminished response or even immunogenicity with our monoclonal antibodies. Small molecules have a predictable PK, and in testing this hypothesis that this might avoid that problem was the analysis from the OCTAV studies specifically trying to see whether low albumin predicted lower or greater likelihood of responding to therapy. And the albumin was not a predictor of lower likelihood of response to therapy. And that would make sense based on the way we understand the PK of the therapy to work. Now let's turn to looking at our selective JAK1 inhibitors where we have data in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I'll start with Crohn's disease and tell you a little bit about filgotinib and then upadacitinib, and then we'll talk about their emerging data in ulcerative colitis. What you're looking at here was the Fitzroy study, which was a phase two double-blind study of filgotinib for moderate to severe Crohn's disease. And what you can see here is that the filgotinib 200 milligram dosing achieved greater clinical remission than the patients who received placebo, also was superior at achieving clinical response, and uh, although not statistically, it was numerically better at achieving endoscopic remission. Of course, endoscopic remission is something that we're not seeing as much in our Crohn's studies anyway. Nonetheless, this is of great interest. Now moving on to Fulgotinib, uh, the selection trial was just presented at UEGW. This was looking at this selective JAK1 inhibitor in ulcerative colitis, and you can see the results here inducing clinical remission at week 10 in both biologic naive as well as biologic experience patients. And you can also appreciate that the higher dose of Fulgotinib, 200 milligrams, was more effective than the lower dose and uh, powered specifically to explore its effectiveness against placebo where it had statistical significance. So the higher dose is what's going to be moving forward. You can also see the clinical remission results at week 58 uh, in the follow-up maintenance analysis. And once again, the filgotinib uh, 200 milligram dose was superior to the placebo, but in this case, also the lower dose worked well in maintenance with the 100 milligrams. So this is important to keep in mind. This may also provide us some dose flexibility in the maintenance phase with the possibility of dose reduction. 
Uh, I also pulled this one slide from the analysis to show you something that I found fascinating, which was that histologic remission with fulgotinib was higher than endoscopic remission. Now this may be from a variety of different possibilities, one of which is related to the timing of the analysis. Another, of course, is based on the definition of histologic or endoscopic remission. And it may also just be that, in fact, histology improves before we see something obvious by endoscopy. It's a fascinating result, and I'm sure there'll be much more that we'll discuss about that. Um, and lastly, looking at hepatocytinib and ulcerative colitis, I want to emphasize um, that this uh, clearly is an effective therapy as a once daily JAK, uh, selective JAK1 inhibitor, and you can appreciate uh, the dose range here, seeing uh, across the different endpoints of interest. Now let's talk briefly about safety. Starting with the tofacitinib study, um, as we've seen across the TOFA studies and in other disease states, the one risk that continues to emerge is the increased risk of herpes zoster. This uh, uh, incidence rate reported here is seen most often after the first two months of therapy, uh, and it's stable subsequently. And you can see across the other risks and outcomes reported uh, that there were overall low rates of these other risks, including DVT and PE. You'll also note that in other analyses comparing uh, TOFA to other therapies that these risks are similar across the IBD state. Now the study that led to the label change in TOFA is, a, is uh, referred to as the 1133 study. This was a phase four study in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who were over age 50 and who had at least one cardiovascular risk factor. It was designed to assess whether the increased lipids would increase the likelihood of a cardiovascular event. But during the pre-specified interim analysis, what they discovered instead was an increased rate of PE and mortality on the higher dose of TOFA, 10 milligrams twice daily. It wasn't seen at the five milligram dose and it wasn't seen in the patients who received anti-TNF. The mechanism was unclear and this hasn't been seen in any of the phase two or phase three trials across all indications with TOFA or in the real world um, experiences that have now been published. Nonetheless, it led to the label change where they said TOFA should be positioned after anti-TNF and we should lower the dose to 5 BAD when possible, which is why I emphasize the lower dose benefit as well as the ability to recapture. It's also why I mentioned that patients who had already failed anti-TNF seemed to need 10 BID in maintenance. So pushing it after anti-TNF and then asking us to use lower doses may not make complete sense. Looking across the fulgotinib study adverse events, you can see them listed here across the different dosing. And there was not anything that was standing out as a different uh, adverse event profile for fulgotinib, certainly no new signals. You can see that um, there's a suggestion that herpes zoster may occur less often uh, in this analysis, and of course more needs to be done, but there was only one case in a placebo patient in the filgotinib 100 milligram analysis, and one case in the 200 milligram filgotinib study uh, who received drug. So that's interesting. Maybe there will be a slightly different safety profile with JAK1 selective inhibitors. And looking at upadacitinib in UC, you can just scan through here and see overall similar and favorable safety findings. You'll notice that there was only one case of herpes zoster. This was on the highest dose of upadacitinib, 45 milligrams daily. Uh, the dose that was approved and is available in the US for rheumatoid arthritis is 15 milligrams daily. So my last slide is just where might we position our jackanibs? Well, certainly um, we have one already, tofacitinib, which is positioned in a moderate to severely active UC after anti-TNF exposure, but soon we'll have several others for UC and also now Crohn's. Certainly uh, something to think about in patients who may be poor candidates for monoclonal antibodies, who have a low albumin or there's worry that they're clearing the proteins too rapidly due to leakage. Uh, and certainly in patients who have concomitant inflammatory arthropathies, where we know that these therapies work quite nicely in the joint conditions. Uh, and there are emerging additional data in ankylosing spondylitis, as well as what we already know about rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just point out to you that an anti-cytokine therapy that works rapidly like this with a predictable 
PK profile might be something of interest as either an induction therapy alone, followed by something cellular we might use in maintenance, or possibly even something where we might consider it as a pulse therapy uh, rather than steroids or for other potential benefits there. And so we can think about some creative combination approaches in the future. And I've summarized for you the uh, therapies that are in either phase two, phase three, or licensed across the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll certainly look forward to our discussion.